الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم نور قلوبنا بالعلم وزين أخلاقنا بالحلم وافتح بيننا وبين قومنا بالحق وأنت خير الفاتحين ثم ما بعد Respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته طبتم وطاب ممشاكم وتبوأتم من الجنة منزلا بإذن الله Here is our topic for tonight Islamic Finance 101 we have a lot to discuss tomorrow, inshallah, between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. We'll be digging in depth. Tonight is just an introduction. And as you see in the, uh, on the screen, we have three different components here, Islamic, Finance, and 101. Islamic, Finance, 101. When you hear the term finance, what comes to your mind? Finance as an, as an industry, means that we have a, a group of people in, in a certain society who do have extra money that they, want to, that they want to invest, they want to give to others for a return. And we call actually this, this function, we call it the fund mobilization. So someone actually has to collect the fund from those people who have extra wealth and they want to put it in a project to make money. On the other hand, there are some other people in the society who are in need for fund sometimes to pay for the tuition fees, sometimes to build a house or to purchase a house, to establish a business, to upgrade their business, whatever the reason might be. And that's called the fund utilization. The fund utilization. A third party in between who is supposed to bring those two different parties together, that's called the fund intermediation. So the, the, the industry itself, the finance itself, means that we do have institutes, whether those institutes you know, could, be, could be banks, could be finance, companies could be mortgage companies, any third party whose job is to bring money from one side and to give it to another side of the society for a certain return, for a certain return, that institute actually is called the finance institute. So if you put those three different components together, the fund mobilization, collecting money, the fund utilization, distributing, giving money back, and the fund intermediation, the third party who is doing the job on behalf of the society, those three different components together actually is what we mean by finance, by finance as an, as an institute or as an industry. Of course, that finance system should be a derivative of a, a bigger system. That system could be an Islamic finance system. It could be a, a communist system. It could be a capitalist system. And of course, you know, the way that, that people collect money and, and distribute money and the third party who's doing the job is doing it for a certain return. So the finance as an industry is supposed to follow certain discipline, certain manners, certain directions, right? Based on what kind of finance system you are referring to. We are not here tonight to discuss the capitalist economic system. We are not here to discuss the communist economic system and finance system. We are here to discuss the, the Islamic finance system. So when you hear the term, Islamic finance, oh, that is a certain kind of finance as an industry that follows the Islamic principles, that follows the Islamic principles. What comes to your mind when you hear Islamic finance? In any Islamic finance practice, whether you are the, whether you are the wealthy individual who does have extra money, wants to invest, or you are the one who is looking for funding from other people, or you are the finance institute itself, you're supposed to have the ultimate level of transparency and integrity. In the Islamic finance system, there is nothing called ambiguity or gharar or misrepresentation or uncertainty. When you get involved in a system, you know from day one, what are you supposed to pay? What you will be getting in return? What's your duties, responsibilities, liabilities? Are you taking any risk? Are you working for others? Others are working for you. What kind of project you are getting involved in? What kind of partnership you are establishing with, with, the, with other people? Is your principal guaranteed? Is your return on investment? So everything actually has to be transparent from the, from the beginning. There is nothing called ambiguity or gharar or jahala or uncertainty in the Islamic finance system. Ethics and values means that, that any kind of project, regardless of the feasibility or the profitability of that project, if that business, is uh, ethically irresponsible, challenges the ethics and the morals and the akhlaq of the society. 
Okay, something that's really harmful, something that, that, that does not belong to the, to the Islamic culture and Islamic practice, it has to be denied. Anything related to adult entertainment, anything related to, uh, let's say, you know, winery, tobacco, anything that's haram in nature, that's explicitly prohibited in Islam, it has to be avoided, even if that project actually is a, is a profitable. This is actually one of the very fundamental differences between the Islamic finance and the capitalist uh, uh, finance that is prevailing and controlling the universe uh, uh, nowadays. Commoditization and asset-backed. The Islamic finance system, you're supposed to get involved in a business that, that makes sense, that adds some value to the society. Okay? You purchase something, you manufacture, you buy, you sell, you commission, you get involved in something that really brings value to the, to the society. Anything that, that does not bring actual real value or service or commodity or merchandise to the society, again, as long as that commodity and that product is a, is a sharia, is ethically and socially responsible one, you are not supposed to get involved in. Maybe you have heard about those like different financial instruments nowadays that people are trading in and the, and the stock market, CDS and CDO and, and derivatives and, and what, what else, futures and, and options. All these financial instruments or the vast majority of them do not represent any actual value or commodity or merchandise or even a service. And that's why you are not supposed to get involved if you have any business to do in the, in the stock market. You, you, I mean, you're supposed to stay away from any, any of those nonsense you know, uh, uh, financial instruments. You get involved in a trading in stocks. Stocks belong to companies where their core business, core business is, is a halal one, as I will be, inshallah, explaining. One of the main characteristics of the Islamic finance system is the, is, is the ban and the prohibition of interest and riba. And in this regard, when we say that riba is, is haram, everybody knows that riba is haram. This is not you know, something like a brand new that, that Muhammad والسلام, came up with. Well, believe it or not, riba was prohibited in Christianity, riba was prohibited in Judaism, riba is prohibited in Islam and will continue being prohibited until the day of judgment. Certain like, you know, verses in the Bible, I know, I mean, put aside the concern that we have regarding the authenticity of the Bible, but you will come across like several verses or ayat by Isa alayhi salatu wasalam or the disciples that prohibit their followers from dealing with interest. Okay, uh, speaking about Judaism, the Quran itself actually is the one who told us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited the Jewish community from dealing with interest. Qala ta'ala, wa riba wa anhu. They used to deal with interest, with riba, while they were prohibited from doing so. So there is a lot of consistency here. Riba was prohibited in Judaism, was prohibited in Christianity, and is prohibited in Islam. If you want to just pick and choose this very particular concept, the prohibition of riba, you can confidently call the Islamic finance system, you can call it Christian finance system. You can call it the Jewish finance system. You can call it the divine finance system. We do not, honestly, we do not care that much about the names. We care about the, you know, the content and the spirit and the, and the essence and the reality of the finance that, that we are practicing. Moving on, Islamic Finance 101. Now this presentation is 101. Tomorrow it's gonna be like, like 300 or 400 level where we inshallah dig in depth and discuss details. What I mean by uh, 101, it's just an introduction. We're here tonight to uh, unlock the secret of Islamic Finance, okay, to come up with a definition of riba and to have like certain uh, maybe some, some basic examples on how to, how to unlock the secret of the contemporary financial transactions to be able to discover where is the riba to be avoided and where are those like you know, riba free transactions to be conducted, conducted safely. Any alternative, okay, any further discussion is not you know, meant to be conducted tonight, maybe tomorrow inshallah. Let's say for example, if we concluded that mortgaging a home in a very traditional way is not a Sharia compliant option. What is the alternative? Oh, we have another fatwa. How about those Islamic, I mean, mortgage companies? All these different issues are very irrelevant to our discussion tonight. They will be, inshallah, very relevant to our discussion tomorrow between 10 and, and 3. We just established that riba is haram. What kind of riba we are referring to? Okay. 
Sometimes we hear, we hear uh, the term riba, and sometimes interest, and sometimes uh, uh, usury, sometimes premium, right? If you, if, you, uh, if you attempt to educate yourself by just going to classical, traditional fiqh books and, and read, you might get confused. You'll come across several examples, exchanging wheat for barley, exchanging like tamar for tamar, ex exchanging rice for sugar, and, 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 and you will be just, you know, like, you know, scratching your head. Is this the riba that we are, like, talking about in, in, in the United States in 2023? My answer actually is no. Those examples are, are absolutely correct. They are very authentic. They are correct examples, but they are very irrelevant to our society. Bear in mind that riba does have, like, several categories. There is something called riba al-fadl and riba al-nasa and riba al nasiya and riba al diyun and riba al and all these, like, big terms. The more you read in the classical fiqh books, the more you get confused because of a very simple reason that the vast majority of those examples do not belong. They are, like, outdated examples. Muslims in the United States in 2023 do not exchange barley for wheat or orange for apple, right? If you want to buy something, you just you, you grab your iPhone, you, you make an order online, within just two hours you'll find the order in front of your, your house. You use your debit card, use your credit card, sometimes even you use cryptocurrency to pay for the you know, purchased uh, items. So those examples are, are absolutely correct, but they are very irrelevant to our society. Forget about those big names, those, those confusing names, okay? Forget about riba al-fadl and riba al-nasa and riba al-nasi and riba al-jahili and riba al-ta'am. Forget about all that. And I want you just to remember, I want you to remember this very particular definition from, because from now on, I'm going to refer to it like several times. When I say riba from now on, I refer to the following one. It is the premium that has to be, that must be paid by the borrower to the lender along with the principal amount, either as a condition for the loan or for the extension of its maturity. One more time, the premium that must be paid by the borrower to the lender, along with the principal amount, either as a condition for the loan or for the extension in its maturity. If you just ponder more on this uh, definition, you will see it clearly that we have like two different kinds of money. We have the principal amount, and we have the premium, is that correct? Premium, principal. And we have two different parties here. We have a borrower and we have a lender. And this actually makes it clear from, from day one that there is no partnership when it comes to lending money with interest. There is no partnership. If you, if you go to Bank of America or to Chase or to Wells Fargo or Capital One and you apply for a personal loan, for investment loan, for a, uh, business loan, right? Construction, whatever the category might be. And if your application is approved, you will be approved for 4% APR or 5% APR. APR stands for annual percentage rate. So if you take the $100,000 for one year, you're supposed to pay the bank back how much? 105 if the interest is a simple and not a compound one, right? And if you want to keep that money for 10 years, then the total will be $150,000 simple math. The bank does not care about the outcome result of the loan. You uh, take that money, you make a lot of profit, you make some little profit, you do not make profit whatsoever, you break even, you incur loss, you uh, like um, go bank, you know, uh, bankrupt, you lose your principal, the bank actually does not care about you. Here is $100,000. You come back next year with 105, right? So this is actually what we, what we mean by riba. And I want you to remember this definition over and over. It is the premium that has to be paid by the borrower to the lender, along with the principal amount, either as a condition for the loan. Condition for the loan means that if you are not willing, if you are not willing to comply with the rules of that loan, with the condition that yes, I am willing to pay you guys 5% APR for one year, then, then, I mean, you cannot proceed with the transaction, right? You have to commit yourself to paying $5,000 in our example for one year. So RIBA actually is unavoidable here. RIBA is unavoidable. If you tell the, the banker or the loan officer, well, I'm, I'm a religious practicing Muslim, I do not deal with interest, the answer would be good for you, but you are in the wrong place. 
We are not, I mean, we do not give money for free. We are not a charity organization. Go on, you know, seek fund from charity organization. We are here a business, a bank. We lend money for interest. This is, this is, your, uh, this is, this is our job. By the way, what banks do other than just lending money with interest? What is their core business where they make a lot of money? It's just lending people money with interest. Is that correct? In the, in the capitalist and the global economic and finance system, banks and finance institutes, I mean, they do make money from like you know, some other banking services, but the main job, the main task that they conduct to make like, you know, a, a good amount of money as a, as a profit or as a revenue is the interest that they charge on the money that they, that they lend. So this is the definition of riba. There is a category, I don't want you to pay too much attention to it, which is, you know, uh, or for the extension of its maturity. It does happen that sometimes you borrow money with no interest. You borrow money with no interest. And interest might be introduced toward the maturity of the loan. You take $5,000 from, from, from your friend, okay, for three months. And if you pay the $5,000 in full, no consequences, you're good to go. If you decide to keep that money more, and he's okay with that, you can keep the money, but you have to pay more. Why? That, is, that, is, that was a very common practice, by the way, in the Jahiliyyah, like before the Prophethood of Muhammad wasalam, And even after the Prophethood of Muhammad wasalam, before the final and the permanent prohibition of interest. Abdullah ibn Abbas reported, كان الرجل يقرض الرجل. كان الرجل يقرض الرجل. فإذا جاء الأجل قال أمهلني وأزيدك. People used to lend one another interest free, believe it or not. No interest. Upon the maturity of the loan, either the borrower would approach the lender by saying, I know that the loan is, is a due. I don't have money. Would it be possible to keep the money with me? Can you give me more time? And I will pay you more money. Or otherwise, maybe the lender would approach the borrower by saying, listen, two options. You either keep the money, but you need to pay me more. Or otherwise, give me the money and you're good to go. فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَذَرُوا مَا بَقِيَ مِنَ الْرِبَى أَنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ So riba in this very particular ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah that I mentioned today uh, in the khutbah refers to that kind of category. Okay, that's called riba duyun. I want you to remember this term, riba duyun, interest-bearing loans. My very humble like experience in this field, more than well, more than 95% of the interest-bearing transactions in the U.S. finance system belong to this very particular category. This is the most prohibited, the most severe category of riba. And whether you follow the, like the Hanafi school of thought, Madhab, or the Shafi'i, or the Hanbali, or Madhab Ahl al-Hadith, or Madhab al-Malikiyya, it does not make any difference. There is a unanimity that this kind of interest is a prohibited one, period. So from now on, whenever I say interest, actually I do, you know, I do uh, uh, refer to, to this one. Forget about the other one. A good example for the other like, scenario where RIBA is avoidable is using credit card in the U.S. When you hold the credit card, it means that you, you have a line of credit, like up to certain limit where you can borrow money. Is that correct? You either use that money for cash withdrawal, you go to an ATM machine, withdraw cash money, or you purchase items, or you just pay bills. And if you decide to withdraw cash money, you have to pay interest. But if you use your credit card for purchasing items, for paying bills, and you pay the, 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 the monthly statement, right, the current statement in full before the due date, how much interest you pay? Zero. So RIBA actually is avoidable. RIBA is avoidable. Using credit card is not as prohibited as the first category, because RIBA actually is avoidable. Right? And, and, and although it might be like too early to, 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 discuss, to discuss details, but w when there is a public and general need, when there is a public and general need, okay, from one side, and riba in a certain transaction is avoidable, that, that transaction would be permitted. That transaction would be permitted. Is it okay for Muslims in the USA or in the West in general to use a credit card? The answer is yes, you can, right? Because riba is unavoidable, number one, and, and there is a general and public legitimate need for using credit card. So you can use a credit card, however you have to stay away from cash withdrawal. You make sure that you, uh, that you borrow whatever you can afford paying on time, okay, before the due date, and you pay that, that outstanding balance in full. As you have noticed when you, 
go with this uh, mode of finance, we call it in a very technical term, risk shifting finance. Risk shifting finance means that the bank is just you know, throwing all the liability on your shoulder. Do not tell me that the bank is taking the risk of uh, default or failure, right? Well, that, that, that risk is a common one. Even, even, even when it comes to Qardu al Hassan, even if you give others interest free loan, the possibility of default or death or just denial of that loan is always there. I'm not referring to this very particular kind of uh, risk. I'm referring to the risk of the outcome result of the loan. You took that loan from the bank and you indulged that money in a business. What is the outcome result of the, did, did you make a profit? Did you break even? Did you lose the money? The bank does not care about all these different scenarios. So that's why we call this uh, kind of riba, um, uh, kind of finance, we call it a risk shifting model. And I want you to remember this term because, because in the Islamic finance system, we go with the risk sharing model as I will be explaining. So the prevailing capitalist finance system is a risk shifting model. As you see here, no partnership between you and the bank whenever you go and borrow money. No risk is taken by the lender or the bank. And of course, it involves a lot of financial exploitation because again, the bank is not taking any liability other than the, you know, the possibility of default, which is something uh, common. What kind of uh, challenge we Muslims are facing in this society here? Is it whether or not riba is prohibited? I don't think so. Everybody agree that riba is haram, right? Is it the definition of riba? Alhamdulillah, we know that riba means the premium that has to be paid by the borrower to the lender, okay, by the borrower to the lender, along with the principal amount as a condition for the loan. Okay, forget about the other one, as a condition for the, for the loan. The challenge that we face in this society here is the discrepancy, right? The, is the mismatch, if you wish, between what we read in traditional classical fiqh books as opposed to what we come across in the real, actual life, whenever you get involved in business, whenever you sign a contract or agreement or whatever, you come across certain charges, certain charges, right? Certain payments. Sometimes you have to pay others. Sometimes you get paid by others. You, I mean, you get charged or you charge other people. Take for example here. Uh, in the contemporary transactions, okay, penalty. When there is a penalty, is it riba or not? Overdraft charge, riba or not riba, we need to know, right? Late fees, dividend when you have a business in the, uh, in the, in the stock market, uh, profit, commission, interest, cashback, fine, compensation, honorarium, service fees, equity, shares, and the list actually goes on and on. The confusion actually comes from here that you come across certain terms in the actual real life, right? That are completely different from what we have read a few days ago in Al-Umdat Salik wa Uddat Al-Nasik, in the Fiqh Al-Shafi'i, for example. Okay? Riba Al-Fadl, Riba Al-Nasa, uh, like exchanging uh, barley for wheat or oil for uh, sugar or uh, apple for orange and so on and so forth, right? So this is actually the, the problem here, is the, as I said, the mismatch or the discrepancy between what we read in the classical books and what we come across in the actual real, actual real life. Our job is to unlock the secret of those contemporary transactions. And unlocking the secret of those transactions is not, is, not a, is not a hard job. I mean, it's not a rocket science, okay? You need to investigate and find out. Is it proven, is it proven that someone is advancing or giving money to somebody else. And that recipient of the money, right, is fully responsible for the principal and has to pay on top of the principal a certain amount. Premium, interest, riba, profit, call it whatever you want. We, we do not care about terms. I'm, I'm gonna inshallah explain more. So one more time, our job is to unlock the secret of those contemporary transactions and find out if it is proven that someone is giving money to others, and those others are fully liable and responsible for the principal and for the return, for the premium on top of the principal, while the money advancer, while the financier, or the lender, or the bank, or the finance company, or the mortgage, we don't care about the name, right? Is not taking any liability, any risk whatsoever, 
that is the riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited, period. Very simple process. And inshallah we'll be taking some, some, some examples here. But before we move on with the, with the examples, let me just bring to your attention a, a, a very fundamental fiqh maxim, qaidatun fiqhiyya, right? It applies almost in all different transactions, right? It goes, al-ibratu fil uqud lil maqasidi wal ma'ani la lil alfadi wal mabani. What matters, what, what really matters in transactions is the essence and reality. Is the essence and reality, not the wording or the formality. Not the wording or the formality. In other words, in a very simple word, okay? We do not care about the names that we use in certain contracts, okay? We do not care about the terminology that people use in contracts. What we care about is the reality of the deal, okay? Is someone giving money, guaranteed principal, guaranteed return to somebody else without taking any liability? There is no partnership whatsoever. If the answer is yes, case dismissed. That's the riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited. When we say fil uqud lil maqasidi wal ma'ani, lal al wal mabani, it means simply that, that even if uh, we use like, you know, Islamic terms, sometimes you read in, in certain, without mentioning names, certain Islamic mortgage companies, oh, this contract is a, is a musharaka one, or is a, a murabaha one, or ijara one, right? But when you dig in depth and, and, and you read the conditions, right, of, of, the, of the agreement, there is, there is no partnership. There is no liability. There is no risk whatsoever. Okay, no maintenance, no tax, no insurance. Principal is guaranteed. Return is guaranteed. And they introduce that contract to you as a declining partnership or as a musharaka or as a lease to own or as a murabaha. Well, we do not care about the names. We care about the essence and the reality. Even if you call that contract interest-bearing loan, even if you call it as such, okay? But there is an actual partnership where the bank is owning the property and taking its financial responsibility, paying for the maintenance and the tax and the insurance throughout the whole partnership long of 20 or 30 years, even if you call it riba, we do not mind at all. Well, it's not riba. It is actually the halal musharaka that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permitted. So always remember, al-ibratu fil uqud lil maqasidi wal ma'ani la lil alfadi do not be tricked by those big names that you know some companies use musharaka murabaha we don't care about those names show me that musharaka in the actual real contract okay are you guaranteeing your principal you're guaranteeing your return without taking any liability no risk no maintenance no tax no insurance well case dismissed your aqd your contract is a haram one is riba one even if you call it otherwise this is what we mean by al fil uqud al maqasid wal ma'ani Let's take some case studies and you will see, you know, easily the, the pattern here, right? How to discover, how to unlock the secret of contemporary transactions. Let's take, for, for example, a saving account. Do we think that saving account is a halal option or not a halal option? Before you answer, before you answer, think about it this way. If I have $10,000 cash and I'm giving that that's money to my brother here okay telling him, listen here is ten thousand you keep it with you until the end of 2024 but you need to bring me back the money eleven thousand dollars okay that's it you take ten thousand you pay it back to me how much eleven thousand what do you call this transaction interest bearing loan where my principal is guaranteed and my return on on, on the principal is guaranteed one thousand in this example what if i change my mind and I just went to Bank of America and I opened a saving account. I deposited $10,000, okay? Based on the agreement between me and Bank of America, I will be receiving $11,000 by the end of 2024. By the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, I don't care about the outcome result of that money, right? The bank takes the money, burns you know, the, the money, shreds the money, uh, gives the money to others, lend the money, I don't care. 10,000, you take it today, you pay me back a total of how much? $11,000 by the end of 2024. Is there any difference between the first scenario and the second scenario? There is no difference. This actually makes it clear that opening a saving account is not a halal option. Opening a saving account is an interest-bearing loan where you play the role of the lender. And the bank actually is playing the role of the borrower, okay? 
You cannot say, well, oh, the bank has hundreds of millions of dollars and you have only 10,000. Is it, is, it, is it true, is it possible that you lend your money to the bank? My answer is yes. We don't care about who has more and who has less. What we care about is the essence and the nature of the agreement. I'm giving my money to the bank, principal is guaranteed, return or premium on top of the principal is guaranteed as well. Well, that's the riba, case dismissed. So opening a saving account by default is not a halal option, right? Are there you know, some, some exceptions? There might be, there might be. But again, remember, this is So, by default, saving a saving account actually is not is not a halal option. How about the overdraft overdraft charge? Overdraft charge means that you have. Testing, testing. Overdraft charge is uh, different. You have a debit card. Debit card actually is connected with a, with a checking account. Checking account means that you use your own actual halal money that you deposited in that, you know, in that account. So you are not borrowing money, you are using your own money, okay? Okay. What if you have only $300, for example, in your, in, in your uh, debit card, in your checking account, and you stop by a point of sale to purchase an item for $500? Usually, usually, the transaction goes through, and you purchase that item for $500. And then after a few days, you will see on your like, bank statement $200 that has to be paid back to the, to the bank, plus $35 overdraft charge. Okay. Now, our job here again is to reinterpret the transaction or unlock the secret of the transaction. Okay, if you want to reinterpret it from an Islamic perspective, okay, it means that, that, that someone paid $200 on your behalf, right? Do you have to pay that money back or not? You have to pay it back. Well, it, it is a loan, okay? So someone lended you $200 and you have to pay it back $200. If that's the only thing you need to pay, and there is no concern here, but you have to pay on top of it another $35. That $35, again, by default, is riba, because the bank is lending you 200, and the bank is receiving 235. You can simply argue that. You can say, well, hold on. That $35 is very justifiable, because this is a very irregular transaction. The bank actually has to do some extra logistic like you know work processing money communicating with the because of that extra work we charge money that that's that's very good argument and that might be the case but again remember the default rule is that anything on top of the 200 will be counted as as riba unless otherwise proven unless otherwise proven home mortgage like very prevailing example everybody is asking about when you get involved I will open the floor, inshallah. When, when, you, when you purchase a home, when you mortgage a house in the United States in a very traditional way, okay, what does that mean? Again, let's, let's, let's unlock the secret of the, of, of the transaction. It means that, that you are 
purchasing a house, purchasing a house, right, from the landlord. And that's a sale agreement. And because you do not have 700 or 1 million uh, dollars cash money, you go to the mortgage company, you go to the mortgage company, and you apply for a loan. Is that correct? Whenever your, 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 your application is approved, the mortgage company would wire that money or write a check, right, or ACH a check on your behalf to the, to the landlord. And that $700,000 has to be paid back, let's say, $1 million within the, within the next 30 years. That's transaction number two. Number three, in order for the bank or the mortgage company or the finance company to secure their money, they put a lien on the property. They put a lien on the property. So if you check the, 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 the deed of trust or the title of the house, you will see your name and you'll see the name of the, of the lending institute. Is that correct? Some people actually get confused. They think that, oh, the bank or the mortgage company is the owner of the house. No, that's incorrect. Incorrect. You are the owner of the, of the house and the bank is the lien holder. The bank is the lien holder. We do not have any issue with the sale agreement. We do not have any issue with the mortgage agreement. In a sense that if someone is lending Rahan actually means, means collateral. If you decide one day to like, you know, lend money to someone that you do not know well, or maybe you like question his or her credibility, is it okay for you to ask for a collateral? You tell him, okay, give me your watch, give me your phone, I'm gonna keep it with me until you come back and pay the money. Once you pay me the money, sometimes they call it pawn business, right? Pawn, have you heard about pawn shops, right? Whenever you come back with the money, I will, I will give you your collateral back. Is there anything wrong with that? There is nothing wrong with it. Okay, we call it sometimes a secured loan, right? Secured, like backed up by, by a collateral. The Quran itself actually is the one who declared the permissibility of Ar-Rahm. وَإِن كُنْتُمْ عَلَىٰ سَفَرٍ وَلَمْ تَجِدُوا كَاتِبًا فَرِهَانٌ مَقْبُوضًا That's in Surah Al-Baqarah. Ar-Rihan actually is the collateral, is the mortgage, right? So we do not have any issue with the with the, with, the, with, with, with the mortgage according to the Quranic terminology, Quranic definition, right? We do not have any issue with the, with the sale agreement, but we have an issue with the, with the loan agreement. So we ended up having how many, how many components, how many segments we have in the mortgage process here? Three different simultaneous agreements, sale agreement, loan agreement, and a mortgage agreement. We do not have an issue with the sale one. We do not have any issue with the mortgage one. We have, we have a lot of issues with the, with the, with, the, with the loan agreement. In the Islamic finance system, if it is proven that one component, one segment of the deal is prohibited, that would be way more than enough to ruin the whole deal and to make it a, to make it a haram one. So the bottom line here, mortgaging a house in a very classical, traditional way in the USA is not a halal option because it does have riba involved in it. Let's take some, some like opposite or other examples. When it comes to cash back, cash back, what does cash back mean? It means again that you hold a credit card. And remember, whenever you hold a credit card, it means that you are borrowing money. Is that correct? You borrow money. If, uh, if, you, borrow, if you borrow $100 from me and you pay me back 110 or 105, what do you call it? Interest bearing loan. Is that correct? If you borrow 100 from me and you pay me back only 100, 
what do you call it? Interest free loan. Am I correct? If you borrow 100 from me and you pay me back 95, oh, that's completely the opposite of, of riba. And this is you know, exactly what happens when it comes to, to cash back. Cash back a kind, is a kind of promotion that, that credit card companies do to uh, like attract or to bring more, bring more customers. If, if you have a 5% cash back promotion, it means that you, that you borrow, you purchase an item for $100, and the net amount that you have to pay back to the lender is how much? Is 95. So that's completely the opposite of, opposite of, uh, of interest. So it's not, it's not riba. Owner finance with, with interest. Okay. A non-Muslim friend, for example, offered you a car. Okay. Owner finance. $10,000 cash. You told him, I do not have enough money. He said, okay, that's fine. It's going to be $12,000 for one year. And he insisted in writing in the contract, $10,000, $10,000 price plus $2,000 interest, okay? He insisted in putting the term interest in the, in the agreement. Do you think that those $2,000 extra are riba or not? They are not riba. Because from a very, like, again, pure fiqh perspective, offering two different prices, listen to this, offering two different prices, two different prices, for the same commodity based on the sale agreement is permissible. I can, I can tell you this phone is for $100 cash, for $110 in installment for one year, $120 for two years. I can give you unlimited options. Once we agree on a certain option and we just, we just, we just like sign, okay, then the price has to be locked. It cannot be increased. It cannot be decreased. Bear in mind that in this scenario here, you are not borrowing money from a third party, okay? It's, a, it's an owner finance, okay? This car is for $10,000 cash again, or for $12,000 for one year, okay? That's an owner finance. You did not go to uh, Chase or Bank of America to borrow $10,000 to give it to your, like, friend or your neighbor, and you pay the bank $12,000. It didn't happen. It's an owner finance. So there is no loan to start with. There is no loan to start with. Sometimes we call it in, in, in economics, we call it the, the opportunity cost, okay? Or the time value, time value or the opportunity cost. In a sense that if he has decided to like sell that car to somebody else for $10,000, he would have been able to make $2,000 profit within one year. So he did compromise that opportunity to give you the car as his friend or as his neighbor. In return, you give him that $2,000 that he has you know, last, you know, had he decided to give that car to somebody else. That's called the opportunity cost. This is one of the scenarios where the time value, time value is recognized, okay, is recognized and legitimate actually in the Islamic, in the Islamic finance system. Let me just skip the penalty clause. When it comes to Islamic finance, okay, it's all about risk sharing. Okay, if you remember just a few minutes ago, we said, the, the traditional finance goes with the, with the risk shifting. Is that correct? When it comes to Islamic finance, it's all about risk sharing. Risk sharing in a sense that no one is lending money to somebody else. There is no lending activities here. There is no lending activities. Take a very famous example, the Mudarabon. Mudarab is a kind of partnership. Okay? Someone has like a successful car dealership business. And he or she wants to upgrade that business, but, but he does not have money. Right? He approached me asking me for, for half a million dollars, okay, as a loan, as a loan. Is it, is, it a, is it a wise decision for me as a practicing Muslim to give someone else half a million dollars as a loan, interest-free loan? I mean, why should I give you half a million dollars to use my money for one or two years for business purposes? You make a lot of money from my money, and then you come back to me with a big hug after two years. Oh, Sheikh, Jazakallah khair. Here is your money back. That, that makes no sense. Why should you use my money, okay, and make money from my money, and you pay me only the principal? Well, I'm not supposed to give you a loan to start with. In the Islamic finance system, loan is a, is a pure devotion and a pure cooperation concept, which means that you are not supposed to lend others money for business purposes. Do not give your money to others. If someone is desperately like, you know, um, needing some, some money to pay for the rent of his apartment or to, uh, like, uh, do a surgery or to pay
pay for the tuition fees, fees of his kids, I would be more than happy to give him a few thousand dollars as an interest-free loan for just a few weeks or a few months. That's called Qardun Hassan. Is that correct? But if I know for a fact in advance that that individual is looking for that money for business purposes, should I give him that, that money for free? Of course no. Well, if you want my money, my money to make money from it, let's sit down and talk business. I can give you that money based on the mudaraba mode of finance. So here is the money, half a million dollars, not as a loan, as a partnership. So mudaraba means, uh, uh, sometimes they call it uh, uh, trust, uh, they call it like trust, uh, trustee partnership, right? It means that someone is offering the management, the expertise and the management, and somebody else is offering the, the money. Now, the money provider is not supposed to be a part of the, of the management of the company. So I give him the, the money, the car dealer, tell him, listen, here is half a million dollars, let's say for one year, okay? You use that money to, to enhance or to upgrade your business for one complete year. If there is a profit based like on, on my math, I will be entitled for, let's say, 30% of your business, of the net profit of the whole business. I cannot tie my profit to a certain percentage of the principal, by the way. Right? I cannot tell him, okay, if you sell that car, I will take 70% of the profit of that car. And, and for this car, I'm going to take 50%. It doesn't go this way. Half a million dollars okay, to be added to your business. And if there is a net profit toward the end of the fiscal year or the business course, okay, what is the net profit of that business? I will be entitled for 20%, 30%, whatever. There is no specification here. If there is an actual real profit, like after securing the principal, after paying the overhead expenses, maintenance tax, insurance, uh, overhead, uh, payroll, you name it. On top of that, if, if we still have money, I will be entitled for 20 or 30% profit. What if there is no profit? Well, I cannot ask for profit. I will be just asking for the principal. I'll take my money and just go back, ma'asalam. Worst case scenario, there was no profit whatsoever, okay? Uh, uh, the, my partner was unable even to break even for whatever they call it act of God like qada wa qadar. something happened there was no negligence there was no misconduct there was no embezzlement nothing wrong from his side right or mismanagement however you know with the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he just lost the, the money well believe it or not I cannot even go after him and ask for the principal that's the difference between the Islamic finance and the and the, and, and the capitalist, you know, finance or the prevailing uh, uh, intercontinental, you know, finance system that is, that is dominating the market, market nowadays. Every single mode of finance you see here, whether it is mudaraba or musharaka or murabaha or ijar or sasna, does have to have a certain amount of risk that the financier or the money provider actually is taking. If that risk and that liability is not proven, okay, and easily recognized in that business, that business actually is not a, a Sharia compliant one, even if it is called otherwise. Uh, let me just skip some of the slides here. Okay. Very common question, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited riba? Because whenever riba is implemented in any society, in any finance system, it brings a lot of financial exploitation, brings a lot of injustice. Sometimes you borrow money and you do not make 15 or 20 percent. People say, well, if, if the bank is happy and the borrower or the customer is happy, you take 100,000 from the bank as a loan, you make 20, 30 percent profit, you pay the principal and the interest 5 percent, and you keep the rest, you know, for yourself. If everybody is happy, then why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making it hard for us? That's a very good question. My answer is, this scenario is not the only scenario that takes place in the, in the real life. Sometimes you borrow money and you do not make 20%, you make 100%. You make 500%, and I'm responsible for what I say. Sometimes you make 1,000% profit. It's absolutely, absolutely unjust and unfair for you to pay the principal and only 5% to the bank and you keep the rest for yourself. Now, the other extreme example, you take that money and you just lose everything, okay? 
again, like with no negligence or carelessness or misconduct or mismanagement, nothing like wrong from your side. It was something like out of your control. You lost everything. By the law of the land, by the system, right? The bank does have the right to go after you, asking for the principal and asking for the interest on top of it. Well, this is very, very unjust and very, very unfair. In fact, the Quran itself, subhanAllah, is the one who made it clear that the main reason, main reason behind sending the prophets, the messengers, the scriptures is to establish justice on earth, uh, on, on earth. Justice actually on, on everything. Justice in Aqeedah, where you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he is the only one who deserves to be worshipped. Justice in, in Ibadah and justice in Mu'amala as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said toward the end of Surah Al-Hadid, لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُلَنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ We have sent our prophets with clear messages. وَأَرْسَلْنَا وَأَنْزَلْنَا مَعَهُمْ الْكِتَابَ وَالْمِيزَانِ We have sent with them uh, الكتاب, the books or the scriptures, والميزان, and the, and the scale, right? Or the balance. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did so? قَالَ لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْطِ So people actually would stand and would implement justice. So when you allow riba to be implemented in any finance system, you bring a lot of injustice, a lot of financial exploitation, in the finance system whenever riba is implemented. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited riba. And the Islamic alternative actually is there. Okay? You go with the risk sharing model. You go with the mudaraba one, you apply it correctly. You go with the murabaha one, you apply it, you go with the musharaka or the ujara one, you apply it correctly. There is an actual real genuine sound long term partnership between the financier and the and the money and the money recipients. Tomorrow inshallah between ten and three We'll be discussing cryptocurrency, if you want you know, to take notes. Cryptocurrency, student loans, retirement accounts in general, right? Whether it is individual, like, uh, like IRA, individual retirement account, Roth, or just regular, as opposed to the employer-based retirement account. We'll discuss investing in the stock market in general, insurance, especially the uh, life insurance, home mortgage, and banking, banking you know, system uh, in general. Maybe if we do have time, we'll, we'll go through more, uh, more, more topics, inshallah. As I said today, uh, Guidance College actually does offer three different programs. The most relevant one to our discussion tonight is the Masters in Islamic Economics and Finance. Here is the link, uh, and I would highly recommend that you go there and you check this, th this program if you are interested to be a degree student. That would be wonderful. If not, maybe you can just pick and choose you know, some classes to take. Guidance College is a purely online university. Evening and weekend college. Monday through Friday from eight to five, no classes. Everything either either in the evening or in the, in the weekend. Affordable uh, tuition, as I said today. And we do have actually in-house scholarship and, and financial, financial aid. Having said that, wh what is the solution here? I mean, how can the Muslim community adhere to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? and obey him Azza wa Jal in their transaction, in their business, in their finance, you know, life, in the same way that they obey him in their salah and their siyam. There is a short-term solution and there is a long-term solution. Short-term solution is what's called a syndication. Well, believe it or not, we have hundreds of millions of dollars owned by the Muslim community scattered all over the country. I mean what I say. Hundreds of millions of dollars are there. And if we decide one day to be like visionary people, missionary individuals who want to stand for their principles, right, and to apply Islamic finance, we need to put our, our, our financial resources together, okay, to keep the Muslim dollars within, as they say, and to establish an independent organization of the secondary market, away from the banking system. Can we do that? The answer is absolutely yes. And alhamdulillah, we do have a lot of successful stories like different attempts by different communities where you know people decided to put their money together and to offer islamic finance practice very good example is amin housing if you have heard about amin housing on the other side of the country and all the way in in california amin housing actually is a is an islamic mortgage company okay they have nothing to do with the secondary market it is a contribution based one uh, 10 12 years ago they asked me and sheikh salah Hassan and sheikh jamal zarabozo to check their, their contract and to find out how Sharia compliant it is. 
we, we were able to see some, some glitches, some violations in the, in the contract. Okay. We reported to them, they fixed it. Alhamdulillah, I mean, their business is almost, almost 100% Sharia compliant. When it comes to, when it comes to residential, when it comes to commercial, they do have some, some issues, right? But again, the issue here is that we do have money, but we need the leadership, we need a decision that yes, it is time for us to declare our financial independence. We want to stay away from banks, establishing our own Islamic institutes, right? That is uh, like one short-term solution. The other one is a half solution. The, the Islamic alternative when it comes to uh, Islamic mortgage companies, they have a lot of issues, okay, when it comes to the soundness and the permissibility of their practice, especially those who claim to uh, do murabah or to do ijara. We have a lot of issues. If you want to read more about those Islamic mortgage companies, okay, and their status, maybe you can go to our website to Amja, the Assembly of Muslim Jurors of America, or just Google Amja, A-M-J-A, Islamic mortgage companies. You will read a lot about guidance residential, uh, university, Islamic financial, Devon Bank, Ijar Loan, and La Riba, right? And by the way, Guidance College that I'm representing tonight has nothing to do with Guidance Residential, so I'm not a double agent, I just sort of make it. <laughs> we have nothing to do with Guidance We do not sell houses. We are, we are here you know, only to teach and to grant degrees in, in Islamic finance. So that is the short-term solution. The long-term solution actually is to uh, is to make a, a positive and actual you know, change in the system itself. And, and without lobbying, without working closely, without getting more involved in politics in the USA, you cannot make that, that exception. Until today, the OCC, the Office of uh, Control of Currency, does not allow banks to make money from real estate. Their job is just harbullahi wa rasul. Their job is to lend money with interest. They cannot own properties for business purposes, right? So in order for you to make an exception, you have no choice but to work closely with lobbyists, with, with, with decision makers, especially in the, in, the, in the FDIC, in the OCC, in the Federal Reserve, to make that exception by allowing, allowing Islamic mortgage companies to actually really hold the property, being the owner, the legal owner of the property, taking all the risk and the liability that comes as a part of the package of the legal ownership, as, as I will be explaining uh, tomorrow, inshallah. So working with, with, with lawmakers, political engagement, and of course, lobbying. Go to guidancecollege.org. Here is my uh, uh, email, and I do have a business card if you want to stay in touch with me. Uh, uh, as a side business, actually, I do a Sharia compliance consultation. If you want, you can go to this uh, link and, and just book a, a consultation, uh, consultation session. I'm doing so actually to help the Muslim community establishing their own institutes. Alhamdulillah, we have a lot of successful stores. I'm, I'm doing consultation for some companies who are involved in IT business in the USA, car dealership, uh, real estate, investment in the, in the stock market. And instead of just you know, teaching and giving degrees in Islamic finance, I'm, I'm shifting slowly from academia to the industry by offering my consultation service again to help the Muslim community putting the pieces together and establish an independent away from the traditional RIBA-based banking, banking system.